This is Jen, and I make useful English Lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices, and more to help you get top grades. So with Christmas coming up, I figured that I would do a video on Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, which I know a lot of GCSE students are studying, and that may include yourself. So I'm aware that there's already lots of ACC analysis videos on YouTube, including mine on the transformation of Scrooge, which you can check out here. So in this video then, I've decided to take a slightly different approach to reading the text, and that's from the lens of Marxist criticism. So if you see yourself as a top grade English Lit student, then stick around for the rest of this video to find out how to set yourself apart from the other Christmas Carol readers with a Marxist interpretation. what Marxist criticism is. On the most fundamental level, Marxism is a political ideology named after Karl Marx, aka the father of communism, and it's concerned with looking at the world as a constant struggle between two predominant classes of people, namely the capitalist, i.e. your business people and asset owners, and the proletariat your labourers and wage earners. So in simpler terms, Marxism posits that human development is an endless tug of war between the haves and the have-nots. In capitalist societies, the haves wield power over the have-nots by employing and, in the Marxist view, exploiting the have-nots. Whereas in socialist and communist societies, the gap between the haves and the have-nots is supposedly narrower, which implies a more equal distribution of wealth and resources. In an ideal world, that is. What's most interesting is that the Marxist paradigm predicts that the have-nots will always eventually revolt against the haves when exploitation and inequality reach an extreme, which is why capitalism doesn't really work in the long run. Applied to literary interpretation, Marxist criticism means reading texts for signs of class struggle, whether it be in the characters' relationships or in their social positioning. Now, in order to apply a Marxist framework to reading A Christmas Carol, we'll have to start by understanding a bit more about the novel's context. Dickens published A Christmas Carol in 1843, which was a period of time dubbed the Hungry Forties, when poverty and destitution were rampant in England, especially in highly industrialised places like London and Manchester. The industrialists and factory earners had little qualms about exploiting the weak and the poor, including children, for cheap labour, and Dickens felt strong moral outrage towards this social injustice. So after the writer had visited the Cornish tin mines, where he saw children working in appallingly inhumane conditions, he delivered a speech at the Manchester Athenaeum one month before working on A Christmas Carol to petition for educational reform among the poor. Combined with Dickens' socialist sympathies and moral conscience, these experiences led the author to write a story which reflected the wealth and power inequalities in English society at the time. This is why the characters in A Christmas Carol are so clearly delineated according to a good versus evil framework. Scrooge as the capitalist exploiter who consistently underpays his clerk and disdains all gestures of charity is the representation of evil, whereas Bob Cratchit as the exploited worker who, despite his penury, still remains optimistic and kind is the representation of good. Nowadays, contemporary readers like ourselves may find Dickens' characterization too flat and kitschy, but with a much more sentimental Victorian readership back then, Dickens had achieved a specific purpose that actually carried Marxist undertones, namely to expose the moral decay of those with economic power and to galvanise the public into sympathising with those in need. Now, from a Marxist angle, Scrooge's transformation from a heartless exploiter to a converted Good Samaritan could be seen as the defeat of the capitalist. To get us on board this moral crusade, Dickens presents a vivid portrait of Scrooge as a harsh, calculating boss at the very start of the novel. As he writes in Stave 1, The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who, in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, 
but the clerk's file was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. But he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room. And so surely as the clerk came in with the shovel, the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore the clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, he failed. Now first, the metaphor of his clerk's corner as a dismal little cell, a sort of tank, highlights the spatial suffocation that Scrooge subjects Bob Cratchit to. Next, Dickens's use of antonomasia in The Clerk and The Master presents a clear power hierarchy between Scrooge and Cratchit. Now, antonomasia is the substitution of someone's name for a descriptive title. So instead of referring to Scrooge and Cratchit by their actual names, Dickens refers to them as the clerk and the master to reinforce our idea of who's in charge and who isn't. The word master also carries strong connotations of enslavement and exploitation, which aligns with the Marxist's negative representation of business owners and employers like Scrooge. The word business is also a key locus for us to understand the Marxist dichotomy between those on opposite sides of the capitalist system. And we can juxtapose two moments in the novel to see how this works. So the first moment is when two street fundraisers ask Scrooge for arms, and the second moment is when Marley's ghost appears in Scrooge's home. I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge, since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen. That is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned, like prisons and union workhouses. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die, the two men replied. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it, and decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that, <laughs> but you might know it, observed the gentleman. It's not my business, Scrooge returned. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Notice that Scrooge's diction here is mercenary, arithmetical, and ruthless. I can't afford, they cost enough, they had better die and decrease the surplus population. And this reflects that Scrooge sees the working class poor not as people, but as mere statistics. At best, productive cogs, and at worst, social parasites. Interestingly, he turns the virtue of charity on its head by recasting it in a negative light, as interfering with other people's business all the while reinforcing his case that by not donating, he's simply understanding his own business as any good businessman would. By having Scrooge twist this moral logic through wordplay, Dickens reveals the all-encompassing extent of the capitalist's power, which resides not only in the realm of business and industry, but also in language and reason. Later, however, Marley's ghost shows Scrooge that the kind of business he so cherishes holds very little value, as the following exchange shows. Oh, captive, bound, and double-ironed, cried the phantom. Not to know that ages of incessant labour by immortal creatures, for this earth must pass into eternity before the good of which it is susceptible is all developed. Not to know that any Christian spirit, working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life's opportunity misused. Yet such was I! Oh, such was I! But you were always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business, cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Now here we see a split between Scrooge and Marley's understanding of the word business. 
To Scrooge, business is purely profit making. But to the now dead, now wiser Marley, he sees that the real business of worth has nothing to do with money or profit, but rather charity, mercy, forbearance and benevolence. Ironically, qualities that motivate one to part with his money. So the narrow-mindedness of the capitalist who only cares about making money is revealed in the analogy of Marley's final line. When Marley's ghost realises that his trade dealings were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of his business, and that he should have focused more on humanity and relationships, not dead, meaningless items like money or trade. Finally, towards the end of the story in Stay 4, Scrooge's capitalist diction is used against him when he eavesdrops on the imaginary scene of his death where people around look on his body in gleeful schadenfreude. We see this especially from the woman who takes down all the bed curtains in Scrooge's home for herself when she says, Hee ha! This is the end of it, you see? He friended everyone away from him when he was alive to profit us when he was dead. Ha ha ha! Now there's nothing more capitalistic than the notion of profit. And with the sound of this word, Scrooge is immediately shocked into his moral epiphany and awakening, as it shatters the core of his identity and shows him that none of the mercenary trappings he so cares about will deliver him from a miserable fate. By the way guys, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below, subscribe to my channel and switch on that bell notification if you find this video helpful so far. This would really help me carry on making these useful English Lit Study videos so that you can get top grades in the subject and we can inspire more people to enjoy the study of literature. In the Marxist dichotomy of owner versus worker, Bob Cratchit is definitely the worker, and therefore supposedly the victim on the receiving end of capitalist exploitation. But by the time we're done reading A Christmas Carol, we realise that the exploited man triumphs over his exploiter, not because he stages a revolt of some sort, but instead because he refuses to be affected by his victim position in the capitalist framework. Simply put, Cratchit's good-natured optimism and staunch family values enable him to step outside of the Marxist struggle. How? We first see Bob Cratchit portrayed in a pitiful light when Scrooge grumbles over granting him Christmas Day as a day off. You want all day tomorrow, I suppose, said Scrooge. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, said Scrooge. And it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. The clerk smiled faintly, and yet, said Scrooge. You don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. The clerk observed that it was only once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December, said Scrooge, buttoning his great coat to the chin. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. And modern HR policies have come a long way since Scrooge's time, and that's definitely a good thing. But anyway, Dickens here presents the clerk in an inferior state vis-a-vis -vis his boss, who taunts him with these cruel, unreasonable comments about how granting just one day a year's worth of holiday on Christmas is somehow unfair because he's paying for no work done. In addition to the faint smile of the clerk, which indicates meekness, the line, the clerk observed it was only once a year, removes the vocal agency of Bob Cratchit by being a reported statement, when Dickens could have had Cratchit respond to Scrooge in speech mode instead. This stylistic decision reinforces Bob Cratchit's powerlessness as someone who not only lacks autonomy over his time, but also lacks the power to negotiate his pay or to verbalise his needs. But despite this sort of abuse, Cratchit doesn't ever become embittered or discouraged. Instead, his kindness and optimism cast the worker archetype in a positive light, as we later see in a scene at the Cratchit family's Christmas dinner, when Mrs. Cratchit carves up the roast goose for everyone. There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavour, size and cheapness, were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by the applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. 
Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last. Yet everyone had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witnesses to take the pudding up and bring it in. A key observation to make in this moment is the irony of such abundance in an impoverished household. Of course, the abundance here is more a matter of descriptive richness than of actual plenitude, as we can tell from the fact that the roast goose was eked out by cheaper foodstuffs like applesauce and mashed potatoes, which means that the meat wasn't really enough for everyone. But the point here is that even with a meagre amount of food, it is all sufficient and enough because the family is bound by their love and appreciation for each other. As the description of the pudding continues, Hello, a great deal of steam! The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day, that was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastries cook next door to each other, or the laundresses next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly, with the pudding, like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half of half a quartern of ignited brandy, and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. On the surface, this is a warm moment of festive celebration. But again, if we were to put on our Marxist critical specs, we'll see that the clerk here attains his own unique triumph over his master. Why? Well, first, the Cratchit's wonderful Christmas meal could be seen as an act of culinary enterprise and ownership. And so within the domestic space, they have become the owners, not the workers. Also, notice the curious use of military diction in the pudding's description. There's the simile of the pudding being like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, and the connotations of fire and armory in words such as blazing and ignited. So instead of staging a real violent revolt against Scrooge in classic proletariat fashion, the Cratchit's only weapons are their optimistic hardiness, which enables them to achieve the kind of self-sufficient contentment that proves their best form of protection against the cruel harshness of the capitalist master. And there you go, guys. I hope this Marxist approach to reading A Christmas Carol gives you some refreshing insights into the novel and inspires some new ideas from yourself as you go about studying the text. Don't forget to check out my other video on Scrooge's transformation, which should pop up at the end of this video. And as always, if you found this video helpful for your studies, please do hit the thumbs up button below, subscribe to my channel, and switch on that bell notification so you never miss a top grade English Lit Study video from me. You can also DM me over at my Instagram, so make sure to follow me at hyperblit over there as well. And I'll see you guys in the next video.